All right, y'all, we are back for our fourth episode of Soda Citizen. I am co host Liss. Um, she is out, I don't know, keeping the lights on. And um, I'm not Kelly Rippa, so I don't get cool co hosts like Strayhand or whoever else to come in. So, uh, But I do have two cool guests, uh, our buddies from Historic Columbia, Megan and John. And I don't really remember your titles, so I'm going to let y'all dive into that. But this whole entire episode is on Historic Columbia That's and awesome. what y'all are doing in the community, the events you've got coming up. And all the cool stuff that maybe you could help our listeners if they, I, I know you may not do like appraisals on stuff, but maybe you can get them to the right places. We get a lot of those questions. So, um, but yeah, Megan, why don't you start since you've not been here before, right. what do you do and how do you do it? Thanks, Brad. <laughs> well, we're really happy to be here. So thank you for including Historic Columbia in the Soda Citizen podcast. I'm Megan Plott and I'm the director of development. And that means I am responsible for bringing funds into the organization and <laughs> trying not to spend too many of them on the way out. Yeah. Yeah, nice. That's a director of development. It's like the, the asking person. That's like, right. Do you get a lot of people like turn around when they see you coming because they know you're going to ask money from them? Not so much turn around, but people, people avoid me. You know, when I see them, <laughs> I bump into them at a restaurant. They're like, oh, I owe her an email. Never mind. I'm going to go to the bathroom. <laughs> That's awesome. And John, we've talked about your role a little bit in the past, but you're also like the person out in the field too, kind of being one of the faces of Historic Columbia, not in the asking role, but kind of the giving role. Well, that's uh, that is true. Um, my uh, title of director of cultural resources is one of those where people just kind of look at you blankly <laughs> and then you have to explain it. And that's fine because that really gives me the opportunity to um, enlighten folks as to just all of the different things that we do at Historic right. Columbia. And I'm not afraid to ask someone You're if they're not. a member of Historic Columbia. And if yeah. they're not, I am empowered to make them one. So. Um, Megan has deputized me in that way and, and really all the members of Historic Columbia. So let's talk about that. I guess um, there's a couple of different things I want to talk about. There's the Historic Columbia, and I'm probably going to get all this wrong. There's like a younger version of it or like a separate version, the Palladium An Society. An affinity group. An yeah. affinity group. So okay. Palladium is our Young Professionals Affinity Group, and we say young professionals, but we mean young at heart. Mm -hmm. So we have members of all ages, shapes, colors, and sizes, and um, they do a couple of really fun events each year that are fundraisers for historic Columbia. Um, so that the next big one coming up is bluegrass bidding and barbecue. Mm -hmm. So every year in the spring, we host a silent auction and, um, we're excited this year to move it. It's been at Robert Mills for the last several years, but right. as, um, we can talk about in a little bit more detail in a little while, we've done some significant restoration and renovations at the Hampton Preston mansion. Right. So we are excited to move that event across the street this year. And, and it will be at Hampton Preston on March 19th from seven to 10. We usually have about four to 500 people. Um, and it's live music, delicious barbecue yeah. and a bunch of great items to bid on. And it's a, it's a really good fundraiser for historic Columbia put on by our palladium group yeah i can attest it really is a good event i actually just used a thing i won at it from last year which thankfully they didn't make me only use it in a year <laughs> but the farm to table dinner down at uh, city roots it was fantastic and i think awesome. i got a I didn't get a good price on it because it was a bidding option, but like it was, there's good stuff to do. It was I a great price for like, us. I won. I'm like, yeah, keep winning. Well, the thing is too, you go to a lot of these silent auctions and it's antiquated and it's long, like y'all's are on an app. I mean, there's good stuff there. The food's good. The music's great. The liquor's not bottom shelf. You know, like it's a good yeah, We just event. got right. Tito's and Jameson confirmed to be our liquor sponsors Ooh, this year. So it's going to go. be better than, la yeah. better than ever. Absolutely. So let's take one step back. So what does it mean to be a member? Cause that's, um, what is a member? What, what are there any perks, or is it just like, hey, we we love these people? I'll take that one. You'll John's looking one at me, but he no, can add okay. in. John's I'll been add, I'll add in don't you worry. Than I have. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so there are definitely perks. A member is is a gift, so that um, it starts at fifty dollars a year and can go up from there to any amount really that you want to give. And starting at the fifty dollar a year level, you get um, free entrance to all of our historic house museums anytime you want to visit. You also are the first to know about anything that we have going on. So you get our email communications first. When we do events that are members only, um, you get an opportunity to, to register for those. We have a number of free, uh, in addition to the house museums, a, num a number of other free events for members. So our renovation um, renovation radio series, we mm -hmm. have one tonight, uh, is free for Palladium members. And Palladium is, again, that affiliate membership level that does have a, an upcharge. So $25 a year gets you into Palladium, but then you get these four happy hours a year, discounted tickets to other things. Yeah. Um, we also have the research roundtable series, so that's totally free for members. Um, so there definitely are perks in addition to just feeling good about supporting the mission of Historic Columbia, which right. is ultimately what, what your funds do. Yeah. You do get some benefit. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, um, I've been a member in the past. I, I might not be a member at the moment, but I, you will be in an hour. I probably got to. Yes, you will be in an hour. Those people in the restaurant was like, damn it. I have our credit card. Um, but no, we did. We were fortunate enough to help sponsor last year. Um, a, a couple of the events, the happy hour series, they had like a water balloon civil war battle reenactment. It was, I think I said that wrong. It, it, it was a water balloon battle in which military tactics for, from throughout the ages sure. were used to, uh, ultimately end up cooling off on a hot That's august true. night and uh, enjoying some libations at the same time well i just remember the civil war park because we had to stay in a line and just throw water balloons at each other like old school so yeah. that was fun that was a great time um and of course there's other events that y'all do th- throughout the years it's in addition to like the one-offs like um going down at the arcade like going underneath that and some right. some cool innovation parts so once you're a member or not um there's a lot of good things that y'all are doing. We get that too. And there's also a lot of places that y'all rent out. I mean, you, you can rent those places. I think I had my wife's 30th birthday party there. And that was um, actually an item that I won at the silent yeah. auction long before I, I <laughs> yeah. worked at historic Columbia. Um, yeah. So we have six sites under our care and four of them are available um, for some sort of rental. So um, we have the Siebel's house is probably our, our, you know, premier rental space, right. a number of weddings and other events happen at the Siebel's house. The whole ground floor is open <laughs> for, um, as a rental venue. Right. And, um, then the gardens of course also are, what, are are the, beautiful what do people place. use that for wedding rehearsals or wedding? Yeah, we have a lot of receptions there and, um, smaller weddings, like actual weddings themselves. We also have a number of rehearsal dinners. Um, we had, we have groups come in and do corporate training so they can have breakout sessions in the different rooms. Staff holiday parties. What? Staff holiday parties. Y'all like to have fun? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, staff as in people from businesses yeah. oh, and business whatnot. So it's not your staff. Your right business now. could come there. Oh, we could. A- anybody's could really. Yeah. Don't, now with these rentals, um, we'll get the Siebel's mm-hmm. house obviously, um, is the one that y'all also headquartered at for the most part, but, um, are there required vendors that you have to use? Like not to the details, but like, do you have in-house like catering companies you have That's to use? That's a great or question, Brad. We, we don't, and okay. we used to, um, have exclusive contracts with different vendors, but we have, um, a preferred vendor list, yeah. certainly folks that we work well with and know that they're going to treat our sites, uh, the way that we want them to be treated. But we, decided a few years back to open that up and let people decide who they want to work with. So right. we don't have any restrictions as long as they're a licensed caterer and that right. kind of thing, they're allowed to, to. So you got the Siebel's house. You've got the Hampton Preston mansion, Hampton Preston mansion, yeah. which just went under a bunch of renovations. That's right? absolutely right. So what y'all yeah. do? Um, it's been an amazing transfer, uh, transformation. Thanks to, um, the care and support, um, primarily of the Boyd foundation, but, but many other, um, individuals and groups have, have been inspired, um, by, uh, by their, their generosity. Um, we have gone in, uh, and updated the downstairs. That is the basement to include uh, public. Uh, restrooms, right. um, two classrooms, and a special events um, kind of dressing suite. Uh, we also have a wonderful sunken, we'll call it a sunken patio mm-hmm. for lack of a better term, but it's on the same footprint um, as a mid-19th century addition that was made to the building uh, about 1850 and then removed in 1969. So it not only gives us an opportunity for um the property to serve as a really great venue right. for events, but there's also that interpretive component to yeah. it. So people get an idea of what it looked like historically right. and how large the building was yeah. and so forth. In addition to that, we've had um, just an amazing uh, outburst of um, interest and genuine growth in the gardens. Right. Um, so the gardens have um, continued to improve on a yearly basis with additions and um, two acres worth of uh, further plantings over the past two years. It's It's been an amazing transformation right. there, truly has. Because y'all have a, a horticulturist or I'm making I'm get this wrong, landscape architect on staff? First we, one was right. <laughs> yeah, we, we have a horticulturist. Right. We have a team of two and a half uh, people who are staff members, um, but they are... Uh, supported by a large number of volunteers right. who like to roll up their sleeves and and you know get involved. Um, the horticultural staff uh, is is not just caring for physically caring for the uh, the plants, but they're also maintaining a um, uh, a living collections database. So you can go on you know you can go on your telephone or home computer or whatever and look up how we're caring for our horticultural collections at historic columbia and you can decide maybe i'd like to plant that in my yard i wonder how it would uh you know how would it how would it do 
Um, so it's a, it's a resource. We've got a lot of resources um, that we've dedicated to horticultural pursuits over yeah. the past uh, 15 years. Yeah. So I think is the Hampton Press in the biggest land that you like land piece that y'all have it's the same size as the robert mills house oh. directly across from it hampton preston is a property that uh, we do not own it's owned by the uh, by the county so it's richland county owned um it's four acres so it's an entire city block and directly across the street directly across, across blanding street to the south is the robert mills house that's a city-owned property right and that too is a four acre track of land with gardens so what what's a brief like I know you could probably go on for a day on each of these guys, but like Robert Mills house. Cause I love it. It's got a carriage house. It's got all kinds of coolness. And so does obviously um, the Preston house too. Mm-hmm. So what's a little bit of history on those? Well, of the two, the Hampton Preston mansion um, is the, uh, the older um, it was erected in 1818. And the structure that you see there today is one of many buildings um, that were part of the original uh, kind of antebellum um, urban estate. There would have been two uh, flanker buildings that were where enslaved persons lived and where you had ancillary um, uh, work being done um, and work primary to the day-to-day operation. Um, across the street at the Robert Mills House, or what we call the Robert Mills House today, that was a home that was intended for Ainsley and Sarah Hall, who initially owned what we call the Hampton Preston Mansion. Gotcha. That was built in 1823, um, but it was never placed to uh, uh, private residential use. It was a uh, turned into the Columbia Theological Seminary uh, in 1830, and it served in that capacity until uh, the seminary moved to to Georgia. At that point, it became Columbia Bible College um, and served in that capacity until CBC moved to uh, North Columbia. And that's CIU now, right? CIU, that's exactly okay. right. And so it's really nice to have um, kind of those roots with right. that uh, institution or those institutions. Um, the reason that Historic Columbia was founded in 1961 was to save what was then known as the Ainsley Hall House from destruction. And ultimately, um, that was an opportunity for Columbians and folks in Richland County and and outside of Richland County to get behind preserving this important architectural treasure. Uh, Historic Columbia was founded. Uh, There were many years worth of um, uh, fundraising campaigns. And then in 1967, the Robert Mills House opened as a historic house museum uh, to the public. And there's a little gift shop in there now and some other stuff, right? So people there's, can visit it. Yeah, yeah. There's a wonderful uh, gift shop there. Um, most recently, uh, our partners with Pond Interiors um, helped us uh, revitalize that space, and it is a showstopper. It's really a wonderful place to go and get important um, and interesting gifts for folks. So I know I'm hopping around a lot because mm-hmm. I do like history. And the Siebel's House, going back to that, so that is owned by the by Historic Columbia. And what is what was that house, and how did you come about getting that house? So the Siebel's House is the oldest remaining building in Columbia. Hmm. It is owned by Historic Columbia, and it was a gift um, gifted to Historic Columbia in the 1980s by Siebel's descendants. Uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful, nuanced building, and the grounds are amazing. Um, it's also the uh, going to be the beneficiary of our annual fund this year because we're always um, working on kind of capital campaigns to preserve the buildings. And in this instance, it's uh, – what we are directing our funds yeah. to. Um, I'm sure it's cheap keeping up these historic <laughs> buildings, right? It's never inexpensive to keep up any building. <laughs> True. <laughs> any building whatsoever. So historic buildings, they have their own opportunity, shall we say. So we've got those three houses. Yep. No, I think there's a... The, we have the Man Simon site, ooh. which is also owned by the city of Columbia, and the Majeska Simpkins site. Um, those are two separate ones. Those are two separate, okay. but they're not too far away from one another. Um, you just go down Marion Street and... Um, you'll end up uh, about a block and a half away from each other. And then we have the Woodrow Wilson family home, which is the museum of reconstruction right. in Columbia and Richland County. That's a county owned property. And um, that was uh, reopened in 2014 to, to focus on the reconstruction era, that post civil war period. Right. Yeah. And y'all used to be part of the big apple, right? I'm not trying to go into details about that, but that was a really cool building right behind the Richland library. That has a lot of that thing's probably been. I mean, talking about nine lives, that thing's seen a lot of different things going on there, right? We did own the Big Apple, and that property um, was sold a couple of years ago to a private in, uh, individual who is maintaining it uh, from a preservation perspective, making sure that it uh, is up to the standards that Historic Columbia yeah. stewarded it. Um, and it is, uh, yes, it's a very interesting. Very interesting site. Yeah. Former synagogue turned African American nightclub uh, in the 1930s. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I think it might be a little prudent to let our uh, 
one or two listeners, hopefully have more <laughs> than that, know a little bit. Like you've mentioned the county owning some, the city owning some, Historic Columbia, and I'm not trying to get into like tax returns, but like how how do y'all work? Like who, I know your board's made up of a couple of different people and private funds, public funds, and sure. um, there's always never enough funds. I get it. So yeah, yeah. we'll talk about that at the end. <laughs> um, yeah, so the Siebel's house is owned by Historic Columbia, and then as John mentioned, Woodrow Wilson Family Home and Hampton Preston are owned by the county, and Majeska Monteith Simpkins' house, the Man Simon site, and Robert Mills are owned by the city. So as such, we get funding from both the city and the county to support the operations of the buildings that they own and to help us use those as tour- tourism-generating um yeah. Heights. Okay. So we um, go to the city and the county every year and apply for H tax funding to support, again, both operations, but also the programmatic elements that bring people to Columbia and Richland County to experience these um, historic sites. Yeah. So let's. Oh, you should. So I was going. just going to say, so the majority of our funding is is from the city and the county. And then outside of that, we have a number of grants membership, yeah. general operations, annual fund, you know, so it's made up of a lot of different um revenue streams. And I'm sure the city and county budget is not enough to cover exactly. all the budget, right? And then your board is made up of by probably, probably some like elected people, right? And I think in some Yeah, appointed. because the city and the county own those two sites, they are um they appoint two people to our board each. So we have two county representatives and two city representatives. Um those are not elected officials typically, um but they are uh, they go through the process to be selected by the county or the city. Gotcha. Uh, hopefully they're pro history kind of we hope so. Pre- preservation. <laughs> right. um, so let's talk. You mentioned programs. So what are some things, John, that um, the average public can do? Like, I mean, are there classes that y'all hold on certain things, or um, you mentioned like horticulture? Like, are there like certain times of year? Like, hey, come out and take some clipping. I don't. I don't really understand. But I'm sure, there's <laughs> something they can do, right? What is it? The public can do a, a lot of things, Brad. <laughs> um, you know, on a on a on a weekly basis. Good grief. Um, as Megan said, you can come. You can take. Uh, general house tours of the historic house museums. You can come um, and enjoy the gardens. Um, you know whether you're strolling or having a meal or whatever. Um, you know, feel free to do that. Th- those are uh, a wonderful asset. Is that, is that free? Because it's public space. You can actually yeah. get into the gardens for free. Yeah, okay. we do offer that as a as a guest amenity. So Tuesday through Sunday, Tuesday through Saturday, the gardens are open ten to four. Yep. And then on Sundays from one to five, and that's mm-hmm. free. There is a. a a cost for admission to do a tour right. if you're not a member. If you're a member, that's free too. Cool. In addition to that, we also have um, some of the things that uh, Megan mentioned earlier, such as uh, research roundtables. That's an opportunity for staff members, typically from the cultural resources department, but not necessarily to focus in on specific topics um, and and lead an, about an hour long lunch um, discussion on recent research findings, things of that nature. It allows us to sometimes bring out some of our artifacts that you wouldn't necessarily see displayed in the historic house museums. Um, it allows our horticultural staff to come in and um, kind of talk about the programs, talk about the research and the work they're doing. And then when the weather's typically nice, yeah. you go out and enjoy one of the gardens oh, okay. um, afterward. Um, we offer a variety of um, resources for researchers as well. We often are contacted um, by folks who want to know a little bit of information about something, where they can turn, who they may call. Um, in some cases, we have those answers. If we don't have an answer, I'm not going to make it up. I'm just going to find out who can right. have that answer for them. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned you're doing a re- renovation rodeo, rodeo tonight. Uh, what, what's that? Yeah, so that's a series that was started probably five or six years ago um, by Palladium, our Young Professionals group. Uh, Out of an interest, actually, many of you may know Debbie Shadel, who was a Palladium board member at the time, was was in the process of renovating her house at the time that was on Height Street. And she and her husband had run into several dead ends and couldn't find contractors and didn't know how to do things and wanted to retain the historic value, but didn't really know what they were doing. So she said, we really should offer this as a service. Um, And so we do have occasional preservation workshops where we actually get into the nitty gritty of how to do windows or plaster or whatever. But this is more of um, a show and tell to show a project that has gone through uh, a renovation that yeah. is typically in a downtown neighborhood. So the the point was kind of to encourage young professionals to stay downtown and realize that that there, these um, projects can be tackled and and here are some ways to do it. So we usually invite the homeowner to invite any contractors that they worked with to come and talk about obstacles or wins or 
Um, and then we'll do a tour, just kind of walk through and see see what they've done. And it's, it's a happy hour. We, yeah. we like the party. So we have, <laughs> have beer and wine and, and um, Rosewood Market very generously de- donates some trays of snacks. So it's it's basically a free happy hour with a little education sprinkled Yeah. In. I mean, I think it's a good point because being in the, obviously the housing business, you have these homes and we've got several right here in Mowers Heights and everywhere else that are that are a little bit older and they haven't been touched yet. They're a good house or good value, but we've also got buyers that tend to be millennials right now that- Are afraid of that. They're not only afraid of it, but like they want the modern conveniences mm-hmm. too. So how do you marry that, right? I mean, you're not going to have the answer probably today, but like you got to find ways, I think it's a good way of doing it, to marry- new technology and comforts with a historic charm without giving up the preservation side. And I don't know if that's actually possible. Or yeah, this is absolutely po- possible. And, and I think, um, you know, there are folks throughout all of, um, we'll call them the historic neighborhoods downtown, um, some of which have, um, the neighborhoods that is, some of which have architectural conservation districts applied to them, in some cases, community character right. designations. So it's a, a lighter um, approach. But all of those um, designations are are generated by the citizens in that community right. working with the city of Columbia. And while we don't have any oversight to that, we do have um, the types of resources where we can go in, we can help people kind of identify those aspects of their house right. um, that they you know need to be cognizant of and preserving right. based on those guidelines. Um, and we also go in and help people, you know, talk about, I've even talked about paint colors and right. uh, identified how old their house is or where they can go and find more research uh, or research uh, for more information about their house. Um, and that's just, you know, kind of a, a small, um, small aspect of um, the, the research and outreach that we do. We also um, work with folks who are interested in commercial rehabilitation. Um, and it runs a gamut. It can be right. anything from, you know, an 1870s building um, all the way up through mid-century modern at this yeah. point. So, um, yeah. A lot of fun. No day is the same. It's <laughs> sure. all different. It's very dynamic. So let's talk about artifacts. And we've talked about this in the past, like appraisals and stuff, which I mean, I think there's a you have y'all have a clear boundary to stuff like that. But like let's say I'm cleaning out my grandma's house and you know, or I just bought this, I'm buying a mid century modern right now and I'm gonna clean out the attic maybe <laughs> and I find something like, man, I don't know what this is. Like, <laughs> is there a way to call somebody at Historic Columbia, donate it to like y'all might be like, I don't want any more of these, you know, things, but how do you all go about that? Or do you say, no, no, let, we're good? No, um, we, we're we knowledgeable yeah. um, of material culture. And uh, while we may know what the monetary value, um, the market value on something would be, we can't tell you that. Okay. That's not our job. Um, if it's something that you may wish to donate and you're interested in a tax write-off, um, there is a menu of, of appraisers that we know in the area um, who will be more than happy to share with you. Um, if it's something that you'd like to donate um, and we find uh, that it would be helpful in um, fulfilling our mission for interpreting the past, right. Columbia and Richland County, um, then that might that might work. If it's yeah. something that doesn't work, I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, give it to us because if we can't use it, we're not going to use it. Right. That being said, I may suggest where you could take it yeah. um, because... Yeah, I'd like to make sure that things yeah, aren't course. just discarded, yeah. uh, you know, without, without trying. Um, artifacts can be a lot of fun. And sometimes you find that folks who come to us kind of get into the detective story behind them. Yeah. Um, but we do draw the line. We do say, you know, it, we, we don't appraise things. Right. It's just not something that we do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I get that. So I think what y'all have done in the past, and it's not really apparent to a lot of people, is kind of some advocacy too, right? I mean, like you're not just trying to preserve some houses. Like or some estates or some history, but like you're also trying like, I would say preserve the city. And there's a lot of mis uh, ideas of what the historic Columbia has tried to do over the years. Um, and I've had some really good talks with uh, Robin. I, I'm gonna call her CEO. I don't know what her actual title. Close know. enough. She's, she's executive, she's executive director. director. There we go. She's the big, big boss. Big lady. Um, <laughs> but like I had some small mis- lady. Yeah, big w- job. Yeah. <laughs> I had some. Uh, I had some misinformation, and she was very gracious to sit down with me and kind of clarify, and it makes total sense. But I think one of the ones, and I don't know where it is in the actual process, but like hit, like preserving historic or preserving the commercial buildings. John or Megan, please say it however it sounds most uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> preserving commercial buildings? Yeah, but there's like a certain like that have historical value to the you said something like it was, I swear, it was a paragraph long, the historical value to the citizens. Adaptive of reuse universe. of important historic <laughs> commercial what structures. To, what are you trying to save, John, commercially? Well, I would say this. <laughs> um, most people say, or many people often say, well, you can't save everything. And, and the reply to that is, 
you know, no, you can't. And in many cases you shouldn't. Right. However, there are those buildings, there are those, um, districts that really do need to be preserved. So as a, uh, as a city and as a County, we don't develop what I'll call cultural amnesia okay. where you just don't know where you've come from. Um, and we don't develop into what would be a cookie cutter, uh, city or County where if you come see us, it's just like going to see them right. a state away or, yep. you know, a couple hours away or whatever. And so retaining that character defining aspect, um, that is so vital to Columbia's identity, Richmond County's identity is something that we work with citizens on doing. Right. I mean, it can be something as, as small as not small, but, uh, yeah, small in terms of size, maybe a collection of photographs, you know, in a, a scrapbook and it, it tells of a certain period, or it could be something as big as helping, um, really interesting entrepreneurs and visionaries, uh, adaptively use a historic structure for mixed use, yeah. commercial, residential, whatever, to create that anchor, um, on a block that allows other businesses to come in and, and perhaps build new structures that are architecturally sympathetic or whatnot and, and stimulate that vitality that all of us want in Columbia and Richland yeah. County. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think, uh, the miscommunication on that was people were thinking it was going to extend to houses outside of the historic overlays, which a lot of them, there's a lot of non historic overlays in Columbia, probably sure. more than there are. are. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a lot of people got up in arms going, you can't tell me I can't tear down my house or add on to my house. And that's really not the thing. And so the city's taking it right now and kind of working through it. So yeah. I found out. But I'm sure y'all would be, not y'all maybe specifically, but somebody's happy to answer those questions. Yeah, people absolutely. Have questions about it. Yeah. But I do appreciate the advocacy part of it because mm -hmm. I joke when I travel, which I do quite often, and people go like, what kind, of, what kind of market are you in? Like, what kind of houses do you sell? And, you know, they're thinking Charleston and Savannah. And right. I'm like, yes, yeah, so this guy burned them all down, like back in like <laughs> the late 80s. He didn't burn them all down. <laughs> you know, so like we don't have all that cool historic houses, which might be a, a blessing and a curse, right? We don't, we didn't get to preserve a lot of it, but like, we also don't have 200 year old houses, a lot of them that we're trying to sell like my friends do in Boston and everywhere else. So I think our identity got to be rewritten and I don't know if it was written the right way back after the civil war, but What's I would, I, I, on so, how many Sherman so, versus how many well, were torn down we so, <laughs> so this is a very timely discussion. Um, <laughs> February 17th is just yesterday. Um, so when so many folks I think have this misconception of Columbia and Richland County, particularly Columbia, um, in the uh, tail end of the Civil War with Sherman, um, Union forces burning all of the city to the ground. Um, There's about a third of the city of Columbia, the original city limits uh, that was damaged uh, by fire. Um, there was as much, if not more, destruction um, in Columbia during the 1960s and 70s and 1950s through urban renewal. Um, you can see incredible amounts of, uh, loss of historic fabric in that area. Fortunately, it was not wholesale. And so we do have some really good examples of 19th century houses. Um, the Siebel's house of course is 18th century, uh, at least a portion of it is <laughs> a portion of it is. Um, and then we have a really nice collection of, um, mid-century modern as well, yeah. kind of sprinkled throughout all of those second generation suburbs. Um, but we have an architectural heritage heritage, um, in, uh, in the downtown and, um, in the suburbs that is, is pretty remarkable. Um, and it's, it's something that I think allows Columbia to be a livable city with a lot of, um, different character, right? you know? And so if you come to Columbia and say, well, I really like this type of housing. Okay. We could probably find that. Right. You know, I like yeah. this, I like, uh, bungalows or I like craftsman style uh, bungalows or cottages or whatever, four squares. We got those. Right. Um, I like ranch style. We got those. I had somebody want a, a New Orleans style house. I was like, we've got five. Yeah. And like, we're going to have to knock on their door because I don't think they're for sale. Like, I can only think of five in the entire city. But other than that, yeah, I think we can find most of them, right? <laughs> but I do think you're right. We do have certain pockets of identity. And yeah. I guess that just merges as the areas grow and people yeah. fill in, right? Yeah. So to tie it all back together, if people want to get interested in historic Columbia, either through giving, mm -hmm. which some people do, or participating or volunteering, like how can they go about that? Who could they contact? Yeah. What's up? So I, would, I would visit our website to start. So historiccolumbia.org. And at the very bottom of the page, there's a place to sign up for e-communication. So right. that's a great entry just to start getting our weekly e-newsletter and, and hear what's going on. 
um, follow us on our social channels. So we have a great um, social media team that does really, uh, really interesting posts, both on Facebook and Instagram and on Twitter. So you can kind of see, see what we have going on that way. Um, we have volunteer opportunities. So we, we kind of glazed over that with garden volunteers, yeah. but there are also a number of ways to get involved on our boards, um, Palladium as a young professional, our advisory council that is more of the advocacy group, um, and then just other day-to-day -day volunteer needs. So we have people who do everything from help clean the houses to lead tours. Um, so it really any any level of engagement. Conduct research. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the next, um, what's the, I don't know, vision of historic Columbia for the next several years. Is there like a certain path y'all are trying to go down to get more houses or it's question. really timely. You should ask that. So we, you know, we actually did no research before. Them. <laughs> I know y'all so well, so uh, I'm looking better than I actually should. We're currently on the cusp of, um, uh, working on our next strategic plan. And so at this time, uh, the board is, is working with, um, literally right now, literally, li <laughs> like literally right now, um, working with uh, a consultant with whom we've had a long uh, relationship and who knows us as an institution. Well, um, staff members are also very much involved in that, um, various stakeholders. So we're excited. Um, I've been at Historic Columbia for a while. People always like to point that out. And I've seen a lot. Decades, of, plural. Yes, at this stage, decades, plural, I'm proud to say. <laughs> at any rate, um, and I've seen a lot of strategic plans. Um, and I've seen that model shift, obviously, from a five to a three-year model. Yeah. Um, and I'm really excited for this next installment. Yeah. Um, it's uh, We've got a lot of folks who are keyed into um not just what we're doing, and so they're knowledgeable about it, um, but also, um, I think, visionary and where they want to take us. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you, if, anything else to add? Anything else you want to highlight for the events coming up? Or just sure. check it all on the website? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's all on the website, but yeah. I'll just plug a couple. Yeah, please. Um, so next week on the 25th, we have a research roundtable coming up. Yep. So that's going to be focused on Majeska Monteith Simpkins. One of the properties we manage was her home. And um, we are going through a full rehabilitation and reinterpretation of that site. So Kat Allen, our director of research, has been doing the lion's share of that um, research work. And we'll be sharing that with members and non-members. So it's $5 for non-members and free for members. So uh, low barrier to entry there. Um, and then on March 8th, we will celebrate the Columbia City of Women's mm -hmm. 2020 honorees. So that is an initiative that we started um, last year with Ren, the Women's Rights and Empowerment Network, and really is is just to elevate the voices of women and the histories, stories of women who have um, made Columbia the town that it is today yeah. and and probably have not been recognized the way that our male counterparts have in the past. So um, that is March 8th from 5 to 7 at the Columbia Museum of Art, and it will be a really fun event. Oh, cool. So if you want to get involved or just want to give money, Help Call support. me. Yeah. Well, 803. Or me. Actually, put down, yeah, put, the, put down my tagline, right? I, I, I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. But then go to the website. They can find all your information. They can, there's actually a lot of resources on there. We do that when we're looking at houses and history, like what neighborhoods you've right. all done a good job on that stuff. So they want to get involved, historiccolumbia.org. You know, numbers, everything's on there. Yep. Absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. I, and I often tell people, um, I think you'll be remarkably surprised at how much return on investment you'll get yeah. for every um, hour you spend with us and dollar you spend with us. It's um, it's an amazing thing. And, and you know, people do laugh. They like to say, well, gosh, you've been in historic Columbia forever. Do you have an accession number on you? Right. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> However, the reason I've stayed um, here at historic Columbia for so long and in Columbia for so long is there's a great value in doing so. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we appreciate all y'all do. We know we're, you're not, uh, they're not paying you what you're worth. I know that much, especially when you're in the nonprofit realm. So thanks for keeping Columbia historic and keeping things the way they should be. So uh, thanks for doing that. Thanks for being on here. Um, and we look to hopefully helping get y'all some supporters and some more money. And um, I think I owe you a check. So <laughs> thanks, Brad. Thanks, thanks y'all. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in to our Soda Citizen podcast. We hope that you found the content relevant and exciting to listen to. We'll be dropping these as frequently as we can. And if you have any ideas that you'd like to see featured here, feel free to drop us a link. Yeah. Below. And thanks to Andrew Miles for being the greatest producer we have in our company. Um, so we hope you found this relevant. Keep an eye out or an ear out because we're going to be dropping these pretty frequently. So see you soon.